All right. Hello, what is going on there traders? This is Chris at Virillo Trading. In today's video, we're going to be talking about being less bad. That's right. Not about being good, not about being the best traders we can be. Actually, it's more about being the least worst traders that we can be because less bad equals more good. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this video. I'm going to try and give you some detailed examples about how this framing has the potential to help you in your trading. It certainly helped me. So I want to explain to you how I stay out of trouble using this way of thinking about things. So hope you enjoy it and I will see you in the next one. Cheers. A lot of us, when we first get into stuff, it could be anything, trading, music, uh, sports, any kind of activity for that matter, you learn how to do the activity. In the case of trading, you learn how to trade, you learn about the tools, methods, um, how to read the market context, how to read price action. What you really don't learn in the early stages of trading is what you should not be doing. And a lot of people end up figuring that out the hard way. What I'd like to do in this video is just shed some light on this idea because this is something that has helped me to become more consistent in my overall process of trading and how I approach the market. And um, it is simply approaching my trading from the perspective of being less bad. So what that means is that I'm focusing more on the fine tuning of the trades that I'm taking, the ones that I can clearly read, the ones that I clearly have confidence in, my playbook basically, and trying to really cut the crap and remove you know, all that excess nonsense from my process, first of all, and from my trading as well. So there's many ways that we can improve our back end. And again, it's gonna be different for everybody because your approach is going to be unique to what you have developed thus far in your own trading. And this is why it's a little bit tricky. So I, this video is not gonna be like, a proven you know system and this is exactly how you have to do it instead what i want to do for you guys is just get the ball rolling and make you think about it this way inspire you to do something different or improve something or do some work that you've been uh, procrastinating so instead of focusing on what you need to be doing to take better trades what you should focus on is what you need to be doing to not take as many so-so and bad trades now i want to tell you guys one thing over my time of learning about trading, learning about the tools that I use for my trading, things like the market context, like the market profile, the volume profile, the auction theory, the price action and the order flow, and the different techniques we use to read the market in real time as well as in historical data. All of these things, when you learn about them, they're all fine and dandy, but the way I've implemented these techniques now is in a way that they're being used to keep me out of trouble more than to get me into trades. Because I'll be honest with you, the best trades, what I call my A plus setup, they do not happen very often, that's first. And a lot of other times you're going to have lower quality signals. It's very rare that I'll have a day where you get, you know, three, four, five A plus setups. It can happen when there's volatility. And obviously that's a whole nother topic because that relates to how we approach the market every day and are ready to act on our signals without any hesitation. Of course, that's part of it. But on the majority of days, guys, the vast majority of days, there is not the ideal action. And again, I'm talking from my own perspective because the way you trade is different than the way I trade for sure. And there might be some similarities, but at the end of the day, the way you improve your back end is going to be different than the way I improve my back end. I'll give you a few basic principles around ways that I stay out of trouble in the market or that I look to stay out of trouble. And a lot of these ways, believe it or not, are based on experiences I've had in the markets. Okay. So the timing of this video right now, it is a Monday, and this is a week where there is a central bank announcement. There's the FOMC on Wednesday. And generally, guys, I got to tell you, I have traded for almost four years and I've day traded for about three. And what I can tell you about Fed meetings is that the price action is very weird at times. On top of that, the index futures, the stock index futures like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ are also having what is called the contract rollover, meaning there is volume that is being rolled over to the next month contract. So there's volume trading on the March contract as well as on the June contract. And what happens during this period of rollover 
is the market changes. There's different price action. Um, volume is not as reliable. And any indicators that are based on volume are just not reliable until the rollover has completed itself. Okay, that in context with the Fed meeting. So in general, guys, I avoid Fed meetings. And that is because I have never really been consistent trading during Fed meetings. I noticed that the price action around central bank meetings, it changes a lot. It gets very random at times. It gets very one-sided. Um, the flow comes and goes. And honestly, it just never was very consistent. So maybe it's possible to develop strategies that are based only around trading the rollover and only around trading the central bank. But what I must say is that the way that I trade on average has nothing to do with the price action that happens around rollover and around central bank meetings. What I'm saying is that the price action changes a lot during these times. It's not really the exact day of the Fed meeting. It's actually the week of the Fed meeting and potentially some of it spills into the next week or the prior week as well. So sometimes you'll often see the Friday before a Fed week will often be slow or potentially it might even spill over into the week after the Fed meeting. And by that time, you might see the action start to get favorable again. But again, guys, it really depends on the overall context and what's going on in the marketplace. Like, for example, if we flip over to treasuries and just look at these daily charts here, I'll just show you some market context. The only chart out of the four treasury futures that are mainly traded, that being the 30 year, 10 year, five year and two year, the only one that has any context on the daily chart right now is really this 30 year right here. Um, where we have a bit of demand zones around these 152 and 17s and 151 and 16s. Um, and if we flip over to the others, basically these are making new lows here. So all of these markets here are basically hitting new lows on the daily chart. So that's part of the context here going into the Fed meeting, um, which is interesting. But like I told you guys, the price action around Fed meetings for me is generally not favorable. So I avoid them. Okay. So for me, avoiding Fed meetings, that is part of working on my back end. I want to tell you a few other ways that I work on my back end in my trading. OK, so I'm primarily a scalper, meaning I take primarily, you know, scalp trades for a few ticks at a time, depending on the market I'm trading. Um, one thing that has plagued me in my trading for a while is trading slow conditions, slow markets and basically markets where there's a lack of good flow going through on both sides of the market. And this has plagued me for so long to the point where I need to literally talk myself out of trading those conditions like regularly, because I don't know what it is, but it has to do with our emotions. And it is boredom. Actually, it's trading out of boredom. It's that boredom that can easily tempt you into taking trades when you shouldn't be. So what I do in context of this video about improving my back end is that I have a trading plan, right? And in my trading plan, I have very specific rules about the market context and about the setups that I look to trade. And I have very specific rules that help me to avoid certain things. And these rules are based on price action that I've experienced in the past, experiences that I've had with my setup, small tweaks that I've had to make with my setup. And all of these little rules that I've implemented, they're not very little, by the way, some of them are very strict rules. All of these rules are there so that when I open my trading plan every day, I see them right in front of me and I know exactly what I need to be doing and I know exactly the market conditions that are favorable for my trading. Of course, nothing is perfect, but you can get an idea for when the market has good flow and good volume. So like I was saying, guys, defensive trading is the priority. I generally avoid trading in the afternoons and that's because I prefer to trade the morning. I feel like in the early mornings is when traders are mostly there, you know, actively hitting prices. There's more activity going on and there's a higher chance that you're going to be able to get yourself into a couple of decent trades with um, less risk. So you'll have better risk reward during these times. Generally, that's what I found early morning for treasuries and even the stock market. Um, afternoons are a little more questionable, right? There's times where the only people that are there are people that have lost money in the morning. They're trying to get their money back and the people that are paid to be there. And honestly, this is basically my guideline is that when the market is moving in like a three or four tick range, and we're talking treasuries here, maybe like a two or three tick range, and it's kind of slowly going one way or it's staying in a range and there's a lack of good volume. I 
avoid that market at all costs. I would rather be doing anything rather than be sitting there trying to scalp one or two ticks out of that market because overall, when you're trading that kind of market, the risk is a lot higher, first of all, because the risk in a slow market is that the market makers, um, first of all, they have an easier time pushing price whichever way they want because when there's a market where there's a lack of flow, a lack of volume, it is easier for the people who have the ability to control a large amount of contracts to basically push the thing around, right? So they will bid it up or they'll pull their offer. And then when they finally get filled on one side, they'll pull the other side. And then that's why you get scenarios where the market stays at one point. And then as soon as you see an order fill, the bids pull for the next two prices and it goes down by two, three ticks. And that is very unique to those slow market conditions where there's a lack of consistent volume going through. Understanding this condition, documenting this condition is one way of improving your back end. There's so many ways that you can work on your back end. And I believe right now that working on your back end is more important than working on your front end because everybody can take good trades. Everybody can spot a good or a decent opportunity. You know, everybody can take a good trade, I believe, but it's about cutting the bad stuff. That's more important than taking the good trades, guys. So make yourself a list of all the things that get you into trouble on a regular basis, try to slowly work that out. What I hope I can do with this video is inspire traders to pull up your trading plan, review it, fine tune certain aspects and adapt them to whatever is going on in today's markets generally. And um, for example, if you take fade trades, give yourself rules about taking fade trades, right? There is certain price action that is good for a fade trade. There's other price action that is the opposite of what you wanna see for a fade trade. So if you're not able to understand these things, then you're going to be pretty much a sitting duck. One final example I will give you from my own case of trading. So for example, if you're a scalper and you trade the treasuries, you know that these markets have high tick values. So the difference between a one tick loss and a two tick loss or even a three tick loss is a quite is quite a substantial difference there. So you probably want to be working on um, some techniques that you can use to mitigate your risk overall. Okay. And this is where the techniques can help you. You can learn a whole bunch of techniques for trading guys, but if you do not know how to stay out of trouble in these markets, you're going to get into trouble because I believe that there are many more ways to get into trouble day trading than there are to actually you know, take a good trade and keep the money you made from that trade. Um, because like I said, the best trades, at least for me, have been far and few. I might have three A to A plus setups in a session. And even that I would say is pushing it on some days. By A plus setup, I'm not talking about home run trades. I'm talking about a trade that I categorize as one of my best reads. It could yield one tick, it could yield four ticks. What I'm concerned with is the accuracy and the consistency of the read that I have on the market and my ability to really kind of sift through all the noise and attack the market only when I know that is my time to attack it. And the rest of it is noise. And if you don't know how to filter the noise, you're gonna end up taking worse trades and those worse trades are gonna add up and that's what's gonna end up with you basically blowing your account. So take it slow, guys. All the techniques you learn, try to frame them in this format. And also let me know what you guys thought of this down below and I will catch you in the next video. Take care, bye.